Yeah, I'm, I'm very honoured and actually intimidated to be here. Um, often when I talk about some of this stuff, it's to an audience that kind of thinks, wow, that's really cool. To you guys, it's going to kind of seem a bit like old hat, but I, I hope to give a bit of a, uh, a more commercial, practical spin on some of the things that you may be familiar with in terms of music technology. Um, and this is very much from me. I'm quite, quite excited to be here. It's a good excuse for me to kind of have a day off from my normal work to do something that's kind of fascinating to me from a personal perspective. Um, so a little, just, just generally, um, my, my reason for being, I suppose, in some ways, other than my family life, is really to kind of try to develop and design products and services that help people in different ways. Um, and that's usually kind of thinking about how these new things, which could potentially enhance someone's lives, actually better fit into their current lives. And that's a really important thing to recognize. So enhancing them, but understand and respect the way they live their lives right now. Um, and, and I do all sorts of stuff, I have done lots of stuff over my career, anything from working in um, car UI and transportation, as I am at the moment, to doing things like enterprise applications, working on trading systems, to clinical healthcare systems, to general websites, interactive and retail space, and all sorts of things. Um, but actually, you know, for some people, you can apply this sort of stuff to music technology, as, as you do, um, which I'm jealous of. <laughs> um, and what's interesting about music technology for me is that it, it, it combines three different things, which are very, I'm very passionate about. Design, which um, I trained in and try to practice every day. Um, technology, which I do believe in the kind of higher values of technology, which is just to enhance the human race in some way through tools that we create for each other. And music, which is a, an expression and a, a good thing that you know, has lasted through all of our existence. So combining those things is great. Um, but my, my general focus is mostly around design, technology, and more importantly, business. So trying to make sure that the things that we create actually have a business value, otherwise they don't go anywhere. Um, and I'm going to touch on this subtly, but maybe I'll make the point clearly right now. One of the big problems, and one of the reasons I think I'm here, is that um, industry doesn't listen to or keep abreast of academic research. I know you all know that, really. But it's a real big problem because you're doing such interesting stuff and the people that can apply it to everyday life and bring it to the masses aren't listening. So a little bit of subtext of this talk is to try and kind of find ways to better get your voices heard, get your work out there so that the world can benefit from it. Because I do think there's value in it. So I want to start by going back in time. This is a really great video I found like several years ago. Uh, includes um, Herbie Hancock, who is a, a great musician, as you would well know. He's also a kind of massive gadget freak, technology freak. And Quincy Jones, who's a, a great producer legend, um, as I'm sure many of you do know. And this is them when they're kind of introducing and talking around the CMI Fairlight, which is kind of one of the original sample workstations. Fascinating video. Um, so, you got sound? We should have sound. Oh. We'll go back tonight. There we go. Let's see now. I think, actually, let me see. Page L. I'm going to look at the library. Okay. Now, there are two ways to do it. You can either write it on the screen or you can play it on the keyboard. Oh, okay, okay. See, if you write it on the screen. That's just changed in some ways. But with a light pen, that's pretty cool. This one, that one. Huh? I see two different kinds of different fish symbols there. It's got oh. a dot. Yeah, it's just a dotted eight. So I don't know which keyboard that is. So it's fine, this is just basic usability problems there. But, but um, I don't know whether, I don't really know the provenance of it, but I don't know whether this was the, you know, one of the first times you kind of saw this, which this kind of representation of music over time in, in like different channels, which is essentially what most digital audio workstations kind of revolve around. Obviously, live is very different. Um, and, and so fundamentally, that hasn't really changed that much in lots of different ways. We have these channels going horizontally. But uh, what was fascinating to me is I actually had a light pen back in the day with my Commodore 64, and I had one of these little um, you know, strap-on kind of keyboards that you put on top um, to kind of play the music and stuff. And um, one caveat, um, I, I, I never really learned to, to play a musical instrument properly, so I'm fascinated in technology to kind of help support my inabilities in that area. Um, 
what was what my first kind of music creation was actually off the back of reading Amiga format. I was just getting into the the hardcore jungle scene. Well, I wasn't quite jungle at that point. And I had a Commodore Amiga, which I was doing lots of stuff that I'm doing like early deluxe paint and design for. And there was this program called Optimed that these guys, Urban Shakedown, which includes Mickey Finn and Aphrodite, if anyone knows the jungle scene, um, they were quite big in the day. And they used to they made one of these amazing hits on this on this thing called Optimed, which works like this. And this is a kind of remix of it. I'm sure. What you have, let me turn down a little bit, was you know, this is just this is time, it's going through loops, and you have these kind of like patterns, and the G3 is associated to the you know the note that's being played. It's a sample, or several sam samples, and what you can do is you can trigger off different points in the sample and play them in this list. And I was just watching this video game when I found it um, last week, and I was just like going, wow, that was a really easy way to kind of create really intricate breakbeats, which was the kind of signature sound of um, hardcore drum and bass and everything back in the day. Now it's all very samey. I won't, I won't play it for too long, I haven't got, got long, but it's really impressive just the kind of intricacy of the beat editing that you can do with just this very basic setup. And you know, the funny thing is, I found all my old um, Amiga discs recently, and I've been trying to kind of get all my sound files and my original song files onto my Mac, and so if anyone knows how I can do that, I've got a, a three and a half inch disc player and stuff, and I'm sure I can read it, but if anyone's got any tips on that, I'd really love to, to know that. Um, but I, I did try to learn the guitar, um, and this, this was my first um, synth, the Poly, Poly 6, which I just played around and made sounds with, but I ended up dumping both of those things and just went straight to, to playing records and um, DJing and stuff, so that's kind of where I started most of my career, until like later on when I started earning I kind of started building up my, my studio again. Um, but over, over, the, over the years, I've been coming back to in presentations I do around various subjects of design. I kind of talk to people who are generally creating you know, software, and I say, well, what, what's, what are the things in your life that you, that you love? You know, um, is it the kind of the people that you, you see, um, the activities you do, or is it the apps that you design? Well, very rarely it's the apps. The apps last very very short amount of time. Um, we're very kind of fickle with our apps, we kind of uninstall them, install new ones all the time. We're very, we, we, we love objects, and, and I particularly love music tech, so particularly these things. So, as, as a DJ, not quite a turntablist, but I did a bit scratching back in the day, not quite this good. Um, I love the Technics 1200, 1210, because they, they became this kind of instrument in themselves, with very robust tools. And um, I love analog synthesizers, mostly because of the direct control you get over a lot of different parameters and just how much you can manipulate and change the sound through, through very minor movements. And this is one of my favorite things, um, and, and my son, um, uh, playing with a thing called Sonorion, which is, an, I think, an amazing, an amazing a musical product that basically constrains the musical palette you have available to you, but makes it accessible to create beautiful music in like no time at all. And the Teenage Engineering, who I absolutely love in lots of different ways, the OP1, a very self-contained sampler, workstation, synthesizer. And they do really great physical design with a really interesting uh, LCD screen that's very modal. Um, and there's lots of stuff that I learn and get inspired by for all of this um, stuff in my work. So I love these things. Um, unfortunately, music doesn't pay the bills for me. Design does. Um, and I do love design, um, but... Um, uh, I, I studied industrial design, which was mostly about making physical products, um, designing you know, anything from a kettle to bicycle indicators to whatever. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, in some ways, um, I spent most of my time doing more digital user experience. Um, stuff you may, may hear about around usability, user-centered design, and stuff. And so less about the physical form, and more creating these websites or services that you know, I can't point to anymore. They don't exist in the world. Quite transient things. Um, and um, as Jamie said, I, I help run IXDA London, which is a monthly meetup, and we talk about how interaction design um, kind of uh, connects, resonates, I suppose, with lots of different disciplines from industrial design, architecture, or even industries like healthcare or music technology, which we're going to do next month. Uh, well, yeah, next month. And um, and like you know things like the Internet of Things and uh, automotive. Um, so we run really interesting events, um, very kind of intimate, designed for discussion, which is really good. And if you're ever in London, um, then ping me and 
Um, hopefully you can come to one of these. Uh, and I'm actually looking for speakers and demos of things for this event, April 27th. I've got Ableton coming to talk about the design and development of Push2. Um, so you might be up against Ableton, but um, don't be intimidated. Um, and I can talk about a whole different bunch of things from, from user interface, user experience, service design, and design strategy. But I want to focus mostly on user interface and its relationship to instruments. So, um, so what is a user interface? It's kind, of, kind of an obvious question. Well, for me, it's around a, you know, a human who's actually interacting with a product or service. And the interface is the kind of medium for that user to understand and to manipulate, control that product or service. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows Bill Verplank. He invented the term um, interaction design with Bill Mobridge, who passed away um, uh, and has worked at IGO for many years. Um, and he kind of came up with this diagram that basically simplifies the concept of interaction design, which is all about you know, having a map, a mental model of the world, um, and be able to kind of act upon what he said was mostly just handles and buttons, and be able, to, be able to kind of feel a response from the system. And one of the reasons they created this term interaction design was because what was happening is you were almost breaking this kind of bond between the physical object and the way it worked, and creating this kind of, kind of I don't know, mystical layer between that has to translate that. Um, so you have this essentially the user interface in a system, or the instrument, that's basically creating a bunch of sounds and coming out. And there's a whole bunch of cognition which I won't go into around how you attend to information, how you process it, and then how you decide you want to act and then actually act. Um, but essentially there's different ways in which you can feel and get uh, feedback and response, and we've already started to explore some of those today, and we'll have more around touch and stuff. But, you know, we use sight way too much. Um, we use hearing, obviously, in music, but we, I think there's more opportunities to use the hearing sense in, in lots of different applications and products and stuff we use. Um, smell and taste a bit harder. Harder to control and manipulate, um, but we do we do respond to them. Different speeds of perception, the amount of information you can get across with these things, uh, different levels of accuracy you can interpret through the different senses. But actually, um, you know, those can work in conjunction very well together, or not. Um, so let's just focus a bit on touch. And and Bill talks about um, handles and buttons, essentially this notion of uh, continuous control, so the kind of infinite movement between things and kind of fluid versus discrete, on, off, digital, almost. Um, and so basically, most controls have come down to handles and buttons in that, in that sense. And he said that actually the best interfaces combine those, so that's why one of the reasons touchscreens work, because you could tap, but you can also drag. Why a mouse worked, because you had a button and you can move it. Um, and he was one of the forefathers of Xerox, uh, Xerox Star Interface, uh, Xerox Park, which essentially kind of created the graphical user interfaces which we've become accustomed to. Um, and these allow people to interact with opaque electronic systems beneath. Um, and they've kind of contributed to lots of different parts of design. There's a visual language layer, which most people associate with design. I think design is mostly about the prettiness of the, the colors and those things. But there's a kind of motion graphic, so how things move and, and pulsate. There's the information design, so kind of how the hierarchies of information are displayed, the typography, how clear things are laid out. The information architecture, which is more around the conceptual relationships between objects, the terms used, and more. And then the interaction design, the actual kind of flow and the changes of state between one thing and another. And when I try to explain to people about user experience, I say that there's all the different layers, and it's almost like you perceive them down this kind of this stack from, um, you know, you see the, the beauty first, then you see it move, and then you kind of perceive its structure, and then you actually start interacting with it. Um, interestingly, and I, I shouldn't have left it off for you guys, but sound design comes in at the top. You, you, would, you would perceive the sound before you, you see something, especially if you're not by it. And that's something, again, there's an opportunity for more of. So all of this stuff is still relevant. It hasn't really changed that much over the years, ever since the Xerox Star interface. Have these visual metaphors. But there's more to user interfaces than just purely graphical user interfaces. There's all sorts of physical telephone interfaces that you might be familiar with, voice inter interfaces, kind of embedded UIs on physical products, etc. with the LCD screens, various distributed interfaces, which I'm going to touch on later, and chat interfaces, which are very common at the moment. So that little bit of an intro, I want to talk about four key areas. First of all, like some patterns, some classifications, some emerging themes that I've seen, and this is very early work, so um, the academics amongst you will probably rip me to shreds on this, but just some early thoughts about kind of structures in, in, in music instruments. And then talk about some potential futures, um, talk about some challenges around that, and maybe some opportunities for you and us to work together on in the future. So some patterns, and 
Um, one of the things, I, I went to the Horniman Museum in, in London at the weekend, because they have a great music instrument display, and one of the kind of things that just brought me back to is the music technology has been around us ever since any technology, ever since like the act, people were making sounds out of bashing things and making music. Um, and, you know, people were creating kind of, uh, over, over time, people were creating all kind of beautiful, ornate things like this. And the funny thing was, as it was going around this, is there was already this, this, this concept of an abstraction. Where they had the keyboard, it would sometimes be kind of hitting strings or blowing pipes. And so we already had that abstraction from the very early days. But a lot of instruments are actually kind of very direct. It's very much around the physical form. So you get the kind of early string instruments, um, you know, violins that follow, etc. Um, to kind of, you know, various kind of early forms of keyboards and stuff. Um, to, to percussion sounds um, and more kind of rubberish type things. Um, and to kind of more complex uh, woodwinds. And um, it got to be more complex when you start kind of talking about brass instruments and kind of more, more complex uh, things like these, which I think are just fascinating, beautiful, uh, and uh, as a result, expensive <laughs> and hard to play. <laughs> it's the funny thing. Um, I think they're just really, really beautiful things. Now, they're all different forms of interaction design, whether or not that was deliberate, but the form has been kind of almost dictated by the form in which created the sound. But we don't have that problem anymore, if you see it as a problem. Um, so let's move on for that. And then they just have this beautiful kind of display outside, one in the kind of park where, where kids can just go up and um, kind of play on that, which is beautiful. So even the most simplest things can make the most beautiful sounds sometimes. So I just think it's worth coming back to. The some of the most simplest things can create the most beautiful sound. Um, so one of the things I picked up there was around a kind of classification of different musical instruments. There was a, a classic kind of Chinese classification which was mostly based on the materials that the instruments were made of. And then more Western kind of classification came in which was more about how the sound was generated. So you would have um, chordophones which were more around the, the string instruments, banjos, guitars, etc., cellos. You would have aerophones whether they were based on the pitch dictated by the, the tube length or whether it was just independent, like a, a harmonica, etc. And then you would have uh, oh, that's not, uh, percussion instruments as well, um, where it's either the body of the instrument um, is actually kind of vibrating like a triangle, or actually you know, a membrane like a, a, on a drum. And then electrophones, this, this category of kind of musical instruments that were electronically generated, which is probably the field we were most interested in. Um, and that's where like, there was just no real association. And I think the, funny, the fun thing, and I kind of explained this already, is this, they separate the form factor from the sound. And that confuses everything. And that's one of the biggest challenges with software. It's why software is so hard. Because people can't actually easily learn and perceive the things beneath the systems because of that interface layer. It's this layer here, this user interface. We sometimes have to kind of abstract this into a way that helps people manipulate and understand. And more interestingly, and over the years, we've had more parameters to it. It's not more than just notes. We're, we're changing more parameters. And so what we kind of get is these different controls coming in, which I think are really interesting. Um, so first of all, like, uh, I talk about this, and I, and I use the kind of colloquial term because it's much more engaging for people. Um, so knobs. Now, obviously, anyone who knows the history of the TB303, which is just a bass synthesizer, made to be a complement for things. It, it was an accident that people started twiddling these knobs and creating basically what became acid house and techno. But it created a whole movement just through the knobs. But over the years, things kind of got reduced down and you ended up kind of getting to the point where you had these really, really powerful synthesizers and everything was hidden really behind this one knob. And, and then as a result, you kind of like, you wouldn't use it so much. And I bought this one of my first laser synthesizers when I had some money. And what happened was people would create their own software to basically break apart the innards and then represent it in software. And then stick a bunch of knobs, physical knobs around it to then manipulate it again. Which is fascinating. There's a failure in the physical design in some ways, but actually kind of gives a lot of bit of control elsewhere. So you saw a lot of that. Um, and um, I mean, you've seen kind of the, you know, teenage engineer everyone has got some quite really nicely made knobs, although you can see a little bit of wiggle there. Um, and you, you can select with some of them and stuff. But you know, the interesting thing is that the, the knobs are coming back in other things as well. So the digital crown on the Apple Watch, fascinating piece of interaction in physical design, not used as well as it could be, but that's being used there. And also with Android Wear, it's actually kind of rotating the bezel. 
And it's not even foreign to like, things like the nest, where you actually rotate the whole thing as well. It's essentially just a big knob. Um, and these are really good, interesting about the pipe glass uh, raspy, because you know, kind of roughly around the same sort of size. Quite interesting things. But um, people love, love turning those. It kind of gives quite a lot of precise kind of um, control through things. Um, so the interesting thing with turntablism is you kind of have this notion of a knob if you consider the record as a, as a sort of knob that's kind of spinning around, it's a bit different, um, and, and faders, cross faders mostly. Um, and what's happening, you see different things around the actual affordances of these different controls. What you see in this is like, essentially, I mean they can move very fast between kind of, you know, precision on the record, but then the, the cross fader is going very, very quickly. So you can do very, very coarse changes in sound from one thing to another, or up, down, or anything, very, very quickly. You can't do that with a knob. And you see things from above here, and I won't go into it more. But so, again, a lot of that stuff is... In fact, one of the tricks when you're kind of learning to scratch is actually that the, the actual record's going quite slowly, but it's the crossfader that's going really quickly. For very good reasons around kind of precise precision of the, the, the control. Um, so strips and pads um, kind of offer the, the opportunity to kind of give both the continuous and discrete control. And this is seen in touch screens, but also in just general touch pads. And I, I, I found this video online and I remembered that I've got this chaos later. And I forgot how good fun it was. Basically, kind of, you can, you just got the XY pad, you know, um, the, the classic chaos pads have these. And you see these sorts of things and things. You can control two parameters at one time, which is fascinating. You know, not with a fader or a, or a knob, you can only do one thing at a time, so you have to use two hands. But with this, you've kind of got two dimensions, and you can kind of go straight. And so you can kind of tap things in, or you can... And you can kind of like play notes as well. And again, using the knob again in a, in a way to kind of like cycle through numbers. And it's constrained to a particular uh, mode and scale because, you know, with, with a, a pad, you can't actually hit in precise spots like you can like hard keys, which is another important point. Touch pads, you can't easily be precise. And the same with touch screens. You have to kind of allow for a degree of, um, you know, drag between. And so you start seeing things like, like this livid um, instrument where, you know, these kind of faders become these, these touch strips as well. And that can be quite useful, and um, it actually saves a lot of the manufacturing cost to do this. So quite popular from um, that perspective as well. Um, and then you are getting people trying to kind of create instruments, um, and so they're trying to kind of mark out particular points. But then the point is, is you can be fluid between the notes as well. So get the idea on that. And then what's interesting is this kind of stuff is being used in track pads on the laptop stuff as well. So this stuff is kind of feeding back into this, this wider world. And this is, this is my major point here, is all of this stuff can feed back into the wider world of um, physical products that we should be using. Um, another fascinating thing that I, I use as inspiration all the time is this notion of a grid arrangement. Usually a grid arrangement of buttons, but it could be knobs or whatever. And it, it sort of started with um, the MPC, which is kind of a classic thing around uh, for hip hop, and piece of people having samples, and they could kind of arrange them however they wanted to. The, the grid was flexible to be, you could put your kicks in one place, or you could put some, some hats somewhere else, and you could decide where you put these sounds. It's not defined for you, you could kind of put notes across it. And they allowed a lot of kind of interesting flexibility, so people were, were using them in that way. The scenario, as I showed earlier, was an interesting grid arrangement because it constrains you with the, the vertical usually being kind of picked within a scale. And it's actually inspired by like a music box, kind of like, you know, this thing over time and the different pitch kind of going through. And it's just such a fascinating thing. This is uh, Kieran Hebden, um, quartet, who was kind of making stuff on it. Yeah, so this is the sort of thing I'm like, kind of like having around. But even um, Little Boots um, kind of debuted in her, in her bedroom this, and it was like, Quite an amazing moment to kind of like compose this whole hot chip cover. And anyone who's familiar with the mono community, which probably you are, um, it's an interesting kind of opposite to the scenario. I mean, it's very similar in some ways, but basically people would create their own software patches, a lot more flexibility. But what it what it did mean is you didn't have enough. Um, it wasn't as easy to pick up and play. 
to actually set it up was a major nightmare. I hated doing it, and I've, I've misplaced it, but I, I, if I found it again, I'd have an hour or so to go. And every now and again, I pick up the Tenorion and just go, wow, that's amazing, I could use that. Um, but what's, what's interesting is people kind of have much more creativity, they can create new tools and software around it, because it's very open source to hardware and software tools. And so people will start to use it like a souped up NPC. You just have way more, more buttons available to you, so you do more nuts and play. But I've always been thinking it's been quite interesting, it'd be quite interesting to map like uh, this kind of grid display to uh, windows management. So in, in uh, investment banks, you might have like 40 to 60 windows open, and you're constantly trying to manage these windows, but if you kind of like turn things on or off, or kind of hide them, expand them, flip the, the views on them, through some sort of arrangement like this, it will save you having to kind of like point and click and move around all the time. Um, one thing that I use as quite a lot of inspiration for actual software work that I'm doing is within uh, digital audio workstations. Um, and uh, one of the things, I, I remember this one quite, uh, I found this thing recently, but um, in Logic, it's just a little thing, I don't know if it's in other apps as well, but at various points you can hit escape and you get this kind of context toolbar. And not just only the escape, but you kind of get a number. So you can very quickly kind of go to a particular command if you're kind of fluent in that stuff. And that's an appreciation of interaction design for experts who often kind of work with keyboards and almost like they play keyboards like it's a musical instrument almost. We see someone using Photoshop or uh, Illustrator or whatever. They're kind of like, you know, just finding their way around these things. The other thing is just like this beautiful thing, which when, you know, I just saw this, I was like, oh, amazing. And I think other things use it as well. But like the caps lock keyboard thing. Uh, it's like someone's actually found a use for caps lock. The most useless button on your computer keyboard, and someone's found it used to kind of like control the state. Like, well, we'll flip into this mode. Why don't we use that for other things? Um, and one thing I continually come back to is, is list management. A lot of the time in uh, software, and you, when you're dealing with lots of data, you often have to kind of return lots of different results. And you might be browsing through a hierarchy, or you might be filtering a whole bunch of results. And, and there's lots of examples in music software um, instruments, software instruments, and things like GarageBand, Logic where you can kind of traverse this hierarchy like this. And the, the interesting thing about this is you, within a short amount of space, you can see you know, which, which um, is the parent and the child and kind of traverse that hierarchy very, very quickly. Um, and in traditional kind of software, web interfaces, you will often have a tree view that then expands and expands again. And by the time you're down here, to kind of get back up to where you were because you went down the wrong path, you have to kind of scroll back up, navigate down. It's just really inefficient. So there's some great efficiencies that I bring into the software world and things like this. And even like, and like the loop filter browser, it's genius. Um, I should have put this, I put there's a concept I did for um, healthcare a and &E app, um, which used this principle. And basically, you can just filter results and just kind of have direct selection. Essentially, what's happening is you're selecting items and then the things are graying out when they just don't exist in that combination. It's a very quick way to just navigate lists. Now, these things might seem boring. They're not waving hands in the air gesture stuff. This stuff matters, really actually affects a lot of the things that people do every day. Um, this is Raleigh's uh, Equator Sync. What I quite like about this, and it's similar to other apps, I mean, you know, it's crazy as fuck, all the, the complication stuff there. It's quite intimidating, like most software instruments are. But you kind of go into, oops, you go into a mode, I can see the mode, um, where essentially, oh, not there, okay. basically you just go, right, okay, I want to just change the sound, and then the sound selection just dominates the display. And, and I think that's quite interesting, just kind of move, flipping between the modes is, is quite good. Now obviously, I couldn't really do a talk and not talk about touchscreens. Um, they have been with us um, uh, ever, ever since kind of like the, the iPhone kind of really took off and made touchscreens very palatable to people. And uh, what was interesting was this kind of, it got very exciting in terms of music apps. So this is when Rebirth first came to the, the iPad. And, um, you know, Rebirth is like the, the poster child of skeuomorphism, which gets massively hated on in design community all the time. Um, and it's still very prevalent in music technology, and I think it's fine, actually, most of the time. Um, but I just thought it was fascinating, you're kind of like cramming all this stuff into this small space. And it's like, it doesn't really work very well. Um, but then I was really impressed when then Propeller had the same company created uh, Figure, um, which I just reopened the game recently. And what they did um, was basically make a very pure touch interface from the outset that kind of limited, gave you a bit more, uh, a bit less flexibility. But you kind of, it was designed for kind of on the move. And you could kind of do really interesting, nice little things about kind of, you know, selecting different patterns from within here and just moving, you know, from different pictures and, and stuff. 
interventions there. But it was just more of a more touch-focused interface. And we're getting to see more of that. This is Modstep, kind of a fairly recent release of Modstep. Hello and welcome. My name is and this is like a full, full on like digital audio workstation almost. You can do so many different things, but it's definitely more touch orientated than, than, than other things are. Modstep is packed full to the brim with useful features for MIDI sequencing. An easy to use piano roll editor, a step sequencer with MIDI modulation controls, a MIDI template editor. One of the greatest things with Modstep is you can use Modstep with all of your stuff. I say stuff. Modstep has support for. <laughs> it's a great voice name, but really good explanation, really dry. Your most favorite precious apps. But what this is the great thing about such screens, screens. the and flexibility, the adaptability, you can completely change. But it's also the worst thing about such screens because you, if, you, if you're a musician, you have motor control, you have, you have you know where the things are, and then that completely changes and shifts. Now a lot of those mistakes are coming into all sorts of interaction and design outside of music technology. So I've oh, been doing some stuff in, um, with a in cars and people want to put touch screens in cars, which is the most dangerous thing you could think of doing. Um, because if, you're, if your touch screen is, is changing its location all the time, then you have to physically you know, move your eyes, kind of actually locate your finger, make sure you're in the right mode, in the right menu. It's dangerous, you're taking your eyes off the road, you're going to die. Um, <laughs> right, anyway. So um, I think there's an opportunity to kind of you know, really think is touch the best, the best solution uh, for certain things. Now one thing, and, and um, we talk about the Seaboard in a bit, but this is their Noise app, which I, I really wish they'd, they'd brought out when they brought out the Seaboard Rise, which I got first, because, um, little bitch, um, uh, when I got the Seaboard Rise, um, I had a huge download, three gig, and I had a dodgy Wi-Fi connection, I couldn't play with it. And I was like, oh, I've got this amazing thing, the unboxing is amazing, it's an amazing, solid piece of amazing kit, and then I can't do anything with it. I can press it, I'll show you the C1 in a minute if you don't know what that is. But this was just a great little app. If you've got a latest um, 6S, I think, um, it's even better because it's got the force touch on it. So, the whole point with the C board is that you kind of have this kind of fluid pitch. You can hit particular notes, but you can also bend them. And you can kind of, with the rise, you can kind of push forward as well. But what I love about it, Really nice thing, it works beautifully, actually better than the Equator app with, with the actual physical device, over Bluetooth as well, um, is that there's this representation that you've got strike, press, glide, slide, and lift. And you see these colours here? There's a little subtlety, so it'll, if you, when you tap it, the red will be representing your strike, and then the press is representing, like, the size of it is representing how much pressure you're pushing on. And then the glide, there's these little lines here in the blue, is this, and there's little subtle things, and it just kind of actually kind of makes you understand what's going on. It's a really beautiful piece of um, software interaction design. My hat's off to them for that, because I think they've created one of the best physical interaction designs for ages. So, it's kind of break it down, is there's a whole bunch of different user interface controls that you can, you can use, and this isn't all of them. I mean, I haven't even gone into blowing and sucking and all those different things, but essentially, you know, it boils down to, you know, there are different forms of handles and, and um, buttons, but essentially you have faders, quick movements, um, strips, kind of like X and Y, kind of hit something at a particular point, buttons which are usually discrete, although they're becoming more pressure sensitive and getting more adaptive, switches, so on, off, but also kind of, you know, zero to ten, and looking around sometimes, knobs which are kind of more continuous controls, and strings, which are a lot more complex to learn, and hard, and what's the things we see in, in uh, guitars. Now, there's a lot of different actions you can perform on these things, whether you're pulling, you're sliding, pressing, tapping, pushing, turning. And, and I think that there's a real opportunity to just come back to understanding what each of these things is best at, and actually making interfaces that consider the fact that the crossfader is really good, the faders are really good at fast, but not necessarily precise control. So on the SH101, you can manipulate the sound. It's not great. It's not great on a synthesizer. The degrees of control you get, you can go quite a bit too far. Um, so, so knobs are better. Um, and you know, buttons are good for kind of like turning things on and off and for tapping. Um, and knobs are, are good if you kind of want that kind of continuous precise control, but they're not good for quick movements. So I think it's just worth recognising these classic things can, can actually be used in your instruments. You don't have to necessarily completely reinvent something. Um, it's more about how you compose these things together. So this is an arrangement of a grid of, 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 uh, 
of uh, buttons and a sort of script and some controls and, and yes, a screen. Um, and you know what you get is kind of one of the common things we see a lot of at the moment, these kind of rich controllers like the Ableton Push. So what we have here is buttons, and what's interesting is we extract shiny LEDs through these buttons now. I think that's been one of the major things. We can communicate the state of that button as well to tell you to now you can use them. It's got the rotary controllers at the top, the knobs. It's got extra buttons there, it's got a beautiful screen. It's got a kind of touch strip for kind of navigating the list, scrolling. And the, the grid-based interface gives a flexibility, sort of like a touch screen, but, but it's a little bit more constrained. Um, so you can have different modes. So, and what you see there is a cascading list like in software, which is really useful. So this is playing drums now, but then you can flip into a mode like that harmony program we were talking about earlier where you can play sounds. So you can play it as like a kind of sequencer, you can play it as a kind of like a more drum, NPC drum, drum, uh, drum machine. And then, yeah, flip into a mode where you can then play melody. And what's good is because they can control the lights, they can kind of make the whole thing communicate which mode you're in. Science. And, and you know, this, this can go quite far. This is the latest uh, matrix brew. I mean, it's got everything, everything that I mentioned. It's got, uh, I think it's got, yeah, a little screen. It hasn't got strings. It's got a wheel over here, but it's got like lots of rotary controllers, faders, and a huge grid. It's just got everything in it. But, you know, things don't have to be completely self contained like that. Actually, what's really interesting about music technology is it can be completely distributed. Um, and then you can have different parts of the system working together. And, and this is an old video, but it completely blew my mind. Um, what you had was the Core Guy MS20 iPad app, and you had these different microcontrollers. And so you had this iPad app brain, you could plug in the keyboards and play that. You could um, you know, plug in some faders. These are already like 30, 40 quid piece of controllers. And then, where's the money shot? And it's like this old classic controller which used to kind of, which kind of like died a death a while back. And it's kind of replicating a classic Quark uh, synthesizer. But, I don't know, I thought this was just cool, actually more than useful. But um, at some point, he's going to connect some cables up and it's going to represent them on the thing here. So. I mean, that's just like super magic. I don't know. There's something about that that just makes you go, oh, wow, that's magic and cool. But it's actually sort of useful as well. But the interesting thing is this stuff, this brain, this iPad app, and all the other things are pretty dumb. They're just input controls and they're outputs. There's a brain somewhere in the system, and then there's other inputs that you can feed into it. And I think that's one of the things that music technology does better than, than most of the, the industries that I'm working with at the moment, is to interoperate. Um, so there's a lot of talk in the Internet of Things around well, how are these things going to work together, or is it going to be how is Samsung going to work with Apple and you know and Nest and all these different things? It's like it's a complete clusterfuck of kind of people arguing about standards and saying well, my one's going to leave. And and I just I just think like you know well we had CV Gate which is kind of coming back again to control things, um, control kind of um, communication between instruments. Had MIDI which is still around, still useful, going over Wi-Fi uh, and Bluetooth. Um, and open um, sound control as well, which is a little bit more precise. Now, these things are sending data to different objects, and there's different degrees of latency between them, but it's sending quite a lot of information, really, that, um, more information than you would need in a smart home, actually, I think, a lot of the time. Um, I won't labour the point about MIDI, but I just thought it was quite interesting when I went to the Wikipedia page. Okay? The standard allowed different instruments, objects, products, services, to speak with each other and with computers. And it spurred a rapid expansion of the sales and production of electronic instruments and music software. And it said something about it kind of in the 80s, this helped the music industry. This interconnectivity, this interoperability. Uh, I won't show this video because it's so, but it's so cool. But it was this guy who kind of made Axel F and he was so gutted when they cut him off halfway through. Um, they were just like kind of fascinated that he'd made this music and it's coming out of these, these keyboards behind him. So, with that in mind, you know, what, what are the potential features? I mean, these are just some example things that I see. 
I think first of all, and, and I, I'm sure we're going to see more of it today, and it's already been fantastic to see the stuff that people are looking at, it, both kind of critically in terms of um, you know, psychology or interaction design, academic perspectives, but also explorative in kind of more generative work. Uh, we're going to see more experimental in spaces. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit unhappy, unhappy if it's all gestural based, um, and this is why. And we saw a little bit of this earlier, like, the problem, and I call it free space gestural, especially, is really difficult because at some point you are trying to kind of intercept a radio wave of some sort, whether it's a visual wave through a camera or through an electromagnetic wave like through the theremin, and it's never going to be precise. Obviously with, with Maya and other things you can kind of detect muscle movements, but it's never going to be as precise as hitting something physically, getting the tension and the feedback from it, um, and doing that. So, you know, there used to be people with connect and they're trying to do drums and stuff. It's like, it's never going to work. The latency was never going to be there. For slow, core sweeping movements, for changing things slowly, yeah, that could work potentially. But there's such an obsession with it in all industries that I'm working with at the moment. And it just fundamentally doesn't work. The other reason it doesn't work most of the time is because um, people talk about like natural UI as if uh, a natural interface is actually a better one. But it's not, if I'm waving my hands around because I'm just gesturing and the computer is thinking that I meant something for it to do, then it's, made, then it's accidentally doing something that I didn't intend it to. And that could be dangerous if you were driving a car and there was one of those in. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Music in space, maybe the, the impacts aren't that great. But you can imagine, you know, a fly coming around, you know, in your face and you want to just brush it off. What's that going to do to the sound you're creating? I think that you can't control the environment as well. And I don't want to piss on anyone's fire here, but, like, but I think it's really important to critically think about, you know, is this really the right approach for this? Is this really the right solution? Because it seems cool, it's always seemed cool. Theremin's always seemed cool, but it didn't quite work. Um, and, and I love the, and we're gonna see some, some glove stuff as well. And it's quite interesting, you have more control over a glove because you can kind of detect through bend sensors, but um, I think it's interesting, but again, Like this, she's recognising that you know she's going through kind of more abstract coarse sound manipulation here, modulating the frequency or resonance or something, or but playing notes. I don't think that's a good idea, personally. Anyway, I'm not a musician, so who knows? Generally, this this point, the points I'm trying to make is it can be quite tiring. It's also very kind of coarse control. Um, the confusion with natural gestures, which ultimately means you know your actions might not be your intentions. But there was some cool stuff coming out. I mean, so you are newest seen this. This is from Nan recently. This is just like So it's like everything. So he's got he's going to What's interesting is the arrangement. It's the circular arrangement. Kind of almost inspired by the iPad apps we have at the moment, but it's kind of well. But what's interesting is, like, at some point, you can, like, you can pick it up and then play with it. Take the product take off the, the base. These pads will These deactivate, pads will deactivate allowing you to control, allowing you control, it, control it from the rim. Play, play button down here. And it's a possible, like, you know, crispy. So it could be really fun. I really want to have a play with one of these things. But I think it's important, like, you know, and I love technology for all the reasons I'm sure you do, but it's, but it, one of the problems, and one of the problems I constantly see in design and technology circles is people, like, see this stuff, this magical stuff, this cool stuff, and they just kind of hone in and go, that's the future, we've got to do that shit. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really dangerous. Whenever you hear yourself, oh, that would be cool, if you're probably doing the wrong thing. So I think it's just, just worth just bearing that in mind. Um, grids are cool, I'd say, you know, more of those, I think not just because of Ableton, but because there's a flexibility there that affords like a little bit of muscle memory and stuff, but you know, these are very popular at the moment. Um, the idea of physical interfaces with digital brains, I, I talk a lot in my work about having a physical product and um, you know, a physical or digital interface and having digital services behind it to creating these connected products. And, and somehow you've got to kind of work about how you create harmony across these things. Sometimes it's aesthetic, like the sounds or the visuals across them. Sometimes it's more about the right inputs and outputs and controls across. Um, and sometimes it's how it fits into a wider ecosystem. And so three different levels of harmony. 
Um, and I think that was back to distributed UI and just some clever things coming out. Like this is the latest Teenage Engineering um, prototype, OPZ, I think. And it hasn't got a screen on it, it's got LEDs that come up. But at some point, what he's using, you can plug it into the screen. You can kind of mix like video as well. This is really clever. Uh, you take the interface off the screen and push it out. And you can flip between it from within that physical it's saying, look, you know, you can have a screen somewhere. Why don't you use it with this thing? We don't have to put all the expense and try to kind of compromise our product development and the cost of this device. When you already have this stuff, just connect it up. It's acknowledging that there's a wider system, and I think that's critically important. I won't, I won't go into Ableton Link, but I think it's a really interesting technology to kind of synchronize. It's an extra thing on top of MIDI that we can hook up, you know, both Ableton Live and any loads of different iPad apps together to synchronize their sound. Um, and uh, so before, the, the knob is here to say, um, oops, come back. So this new core uh, MIDI log allows a lot of kind of control over the parameters and it really, works really well. Some nice, um, some sounds you can get out of that, that machine. This is a modern instrument. You know, I've seen it in cars, you know, you're getting the kind of screens kind of distributed to kind of these, you know, these physical knobs as well. And I heard a story from, you know, people who, who designed the BMW iDrive. This, this thing it is designed rather than a touch screen because your arm is resting and it's in a solid place. And when you're driving 150 miles an hour on the autobahn, you're not kind of trying to do that. Your arm is in a rested place and you can control it as well as the, the steering wheel if you need. So you're getting these lots of different kind of uh, knobs coming out. And, in fact, there's a, there's a site devoted to, to uh, knobs on audio hi-fi, which is just a good bit of fun. But this was a um, knob, knob, knob of the year, I think. Um, this is a new name, fairly new name. People love touching knobs, um, but like... Uh, <laughs> But, but there's lots of good reasons for it as well, but, but you know, he, he, it's quite a funny, funny sight. But he's evaluating the feel of it, like how much it moves and the kind of the, the, the solidness of it and stuff. And, and that has an effect on perception of quality. Um, I think kind of what I'm trying to say here in some ways is that actually the future is already around us a lot. And this is so cliche in most tech, tech things. It's just not, we just need to pick up on it more and look around and actually share it. Um, and actually kind of make it more, more present to, to the rest of the, of the world. And actually kind of take the things that work and, and bring them to, to the masses. And um, in one of my, my decks, I talk about the future user interface. I went around my home and kind of like, kind of classified different interface controls. And there was lots of knobs, you know, anything from kind of washer to, to you know, um, not the shower, sorry, my nest to stereos, lots of different buttons, lots of different switches and lots of different levers and handles. And, and when you kind of look at like a lot of the new technology, whether it's software or hardware, they're just different builds on the same thing. Because it works. If you use it in the right ways. So I say come back to some of these things, these, some of these common patterns, these some common UI controls and use them in the right ways. And then try and do some clever bits in the, in, in the background to kind of make it work as part of the system. So be, the future will be like today with a few little twists. So a few quick, quick challenges. I think that Actually, there's a really interesting step, and why, why I'm here, and I'm finding it fascinating today, and why I'm interested in this area, I, I use music technology as a source of inspiration. Mostly, I follow Peter Kern to create the digital music site, because it's just awesome. Um, but uh, I use it all the time for inspiration, because there's a lack of inspiration in, in the wider world, and I'm too much focus on touch screens. But one of the challenges, is when I talk about it to my peers, they're like, music tech, well, that's geeky or just very niche. How, what, what relationship has it got? To, to the work we're doing. Um, and I find it hard to kind of sell and communicate without you know, actually doing the work of actually making ideas. And one of the challenges, even though I'm, I have a fetish for hardware, it's really great, but it's really hard and expensive to manufacture. People will talk about 3D printing, but that's not mass manufacture at all. So it takes a lot to kind of get um, things to market. There's a reason why the Rode Seaboard um, took so long to get to, to market and why it was so expensive at first, but they're doing their best to get, get the prices down. And um, one important point that's come up already before is that music technology is really hard 
to learn, but it's also very intimidating. Um, and, and it's a challenge here because you, you want to give people power and control, but you also want to make it accessible to people. And those things often work in tension. So if you make it really overly simplified, then you, you, you take away a lot of the power and flexibility that the, the things have. So it's a kind of ongoing challenge that we'll have. Um, and this other question in the mind when you're doing this is, are you developing a kind of standalone thing, or are you developing a component, a controller or whatever, as part of a bigger system? And that's a big question to be asking whenever you're doing work in this space, I think. So those challenges, so lack of aggressive UI, if you're talking seriously about music tech, um, hardware is great, but it's expensive to make, and music tech is hard to learn and intimidating. And there's this product and um, system tension. So, what, what, where do I think we should focus? Well, first of all, I think what's interesting is that despite the manufacturing challenges, we, we, we're, we've got this abstraction of what we've been talking about before. The interface is an abstraction of the actual system we have. We can make the interface to be whatever we need it to be within certain constraints. Um, it's about choice. We can decide whether it's a software interface, like a graphical user interface, a physical one, whatever. It's about making the right choice, though. We can create new instruments and new things, but maybe kind of think about building on those components in the past. And, and this is the, the seaboard, and, and it's beautiful. So I have to show this. I've been hyping the seaboard for many, many years. And when I first played on it, just the, the amazing feel of actually plunging into something that's, that's kind of soft, this soft silicon. You kind of get in resistance, but it's, and it's pushing back. And you kind of, when you're bending it, it feels like you're actually pushing against something. It's not this free space, I can't feel I'm pushing against there. But like, I mean, when you kind of zoom in, there's, and maybe these, these kind of more zoomed in shots kind of show more crudely, but I'm trying to just emphasize like, you know, you're pushing this bit of silicon, and it's like squeezing it, and it's just, I can't, I can't describe the feeling, I can try and just zoom in and show you, but it, but it's like, uh, these key ways yeah. So you're kind of doing what you could do with the controls, um, you know, like a, a rotary controller and a fader and stuff, but you're kind of feeling and pushing. It's not going to be precise. And one of the hard things is actually playing straight notes on the, the seaboard is quite difficult. Um, no, less less seaboard form. Um, what I think is quite interesting, I've been saying it for many years to people, so you actually lots of things I see in music tech allow you to kind of inspire peripherals beyond music technology. and, and I wanted some of my um, dev team in a previous company, I was like saying, I really want to hook up one of these controllers to like a Zoom thing in, a, in, a, in an application. And then, and then uh, someone kind of published this, which is basically taking one of these cheap 30, 40 quid microcontrollers um, from Korg and uh, using it in Lightroom. So, Welcome to the Hunter Report, guys. Today we're going to talk photography, talk photography and how you can, how you can hook up a MIDI, MIDI controller into Lightroom, into Lightroom to do, to do so multiple parameters at once. Uh, no. so obviously, that was great. This, this is, is the Hunter Report, and arguably it should be a rotary dial, not one. Show you, exactly. show you exactly. but, it, but it's very interesting, and, and um, you could be using these things in lots of different kind of expert applications to do a lot of control. I think that there's a real big opportunity for kind of taking what we're learning in music technology. Right. The other thing is that, you know, I said before, it, it, the critical thing is somehow to kind of bet more make examples and, and share it with the world. And I think it's hard because there's so much noise in the world at the moment, or various things, various tech coming up. But I think, you know, kind of creating these prototypes that cut through is, is quite tricky, but it's definitely worth investing. And, and there's been some interesting examples. So Berg um, Studio that, that shut down, a um, couple of years ago, they did some really good stuff. They were really good with their video to kind of get their prototypes and sell a bigger concept around, which is like, this was like a connected washing machine. And, and in fact, like, you know, Google obviously have a lot of money, but, um, you know, Google Glass is ultimately the, the, the ultimate prototype in beta. And they learned a lot from it by putting it out there in the market, as much as, you know, you look like an idiot wearing it. Um, I think it's interesting to kind of be putting these things out there. And I know you're all familiar with, like, various bits of Arduino, other technology, do this, but but these these things are kind of empowering in, in the sense that they're allowing you know people with, with less technical ability to do stuff. But the problem is with like say an Arduino is that it didn't really deliver on that promise because you would spend like in a workshop you'd spend half a day trying to understand the basics and then you're caught in syntax and that's no good for designers and musicians. And so you get things like Sound Labs, who I'm a massive proponent of as well, that London-based um, company that creates these little Bluetooth connected. Um, components and we ran a, a, a workshop and 
within like um, 20 minutes, people were making like smart home prototypes with like buttons and sensors and this kind of digital brain. So I think there's opportunity to kind of make these things, but then to kind of somehow publish and share with the world, to so the commercial world, and put them out as provocations, not just within academic sharing. And I think going back to things, we should be kind of creating new interactions out of all the paradigms, so the knobs, the buttons, etc. Um, and one of the more challenging things is to kind of make these more accessible and usable solutions. So be careful of the shiny stuff and try to maybe adopt some user-centered design, which is reassuring to hear people talking about, which is ultimately to kind of understand your users by observing the way they actually use things, not just by what they say and what you think they do and what you do, but actually what other people do and just watch them trying to do something and then try to kind of take these prototypes out to them as soon as possible and refine them constantly and then just chuck them away if they're really not working, try something different and continually refine based on feedback. And then, you know, when you launch something, look, listen to why it hasn't launched. I mean, you know, tech companies just don't do this basic stuff all the time. What I thought was brilliant was this quote from Peter Kerr, I mean, he was talking about Push 2. And he talks about it, because I'm going to read it out. So, so on Push 2, I'm told there was um, uh, an extraordinary amount of user testing where able to designers had to watch and analyze the way people were using the hardware. I don't know exactly what happened, but I do know this. Magically, buttons on Push 2 seemed to pop up where I expected them to be before I knew they were there. Now, he kind of then kind of says, oh, I'm not really sure this is just down to the use of research and stuff. They obviously haven't made design decisions, obviously. But there's kind of an insight to kind of say, well, look, actually just watch these people. You can create better stuff. And actually just push two is just an elaboration and enhancement on, on the first one. Um, and the other thing, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, and the roadie's not quite there yet. It's got a beautiful instrument, but it's not creating a new type of sound yet. Um, it's trying to mimic old sounds, electric guitars, and all sorts of things. And I, I saw this quote, which was fascinating. Like Ray Charles was talking about how the Rhodes piano had the effect of an atom bomb on the musical landscape and changed things forever, just like the TB303 did. Well, what's our new instrument? What's our new thing? So I think we can create new instruments, inspire peripherals beyond music, make and share more, create new interactions out of old UI, Improve the accessibility and usability of the things we do. Otherwise, no one's going to adopt them in the first place, no matter how, how cool they are. And enable new kind of sound movements if we can. And uh, should we should be, you know, reminding ourselves that, you know, I think we should be designing things that kind of fit into our worlds and enhance our lives. And this, this quote just from this guy, Ableton Ed, who I've been talking with, it just sums it up brilliantly. When you're when you're out your heart and soul into making something, and then seeing what someone else can do with that, it's hard to describe, hard to describe that. that. Whenever, Whenever I go to a gig and I see a laptop thing or something, something that looks like push on stage, which I always like pre browned to look to see, to see if it's live, there, live there on the screen. If you're ever, if you're ever feeling tired, tired, tired or exhausted or maybe frustrated with something that you're working on, like just, the just a reminder of what people are doing with the stuff that you're making. Uh, and a tremendous kicking the pants to get you going again. Right. That's great. So, I mean, I know a lot of you, you work in kind of research and academia, but but don't you want lots of people in the world to use the things you're creating? That's why I'm a designer. Maybe I'm different, I don't know. And I think it's really important that there's people in the world who will research and explore, but there's also a kind of need to kind of pull that back, bring it in and make it accessible to people. And that's what Ed has the joy of doing, and I'm jealous of him in lots of ways. So try and find a way to kind of get out of the labs and bring this stuff to the world. So I'm going to finish off just finally, just come back to Herbie Hancock, because he just says quite a few things very insightfully in this closing clip. So. I think, I, think I, was thinking, I think I was thinking, um, seeing you, seeing you here, here, here with all these instruments and this sophistication of electronics and everything, but uh, still the African blood, blood is doing uh, 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 Right. Right. It's interesting because, um, yeah, you know, these, these instruments, instruments were designed, were designed for people to use. People, for people to use. Right. You know, it's just a, you know, tool, just a tool, tool, another tool. The way, the way, the way an axe is a tool. tool. An axe can be a tool to, 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 to cut wood to build a house. It can, can be a tool to slaughter your neighbor. Your neighbor. You know, you know. Same thing. Same thing. Synthesizer can, can be a tool, a tool to really hurt people's ears and interfere with their lives. It can be a tool to make a really nice sounding instrument that can really affect people in a positive way. It all depends on the person that's using it. 
people blame, people machines, blame machines very, very often, very often for, for the machine's, machine's, machine's fault. We have to plug it in. The machine doesn't do anything. We sit there until we plug it in. It doesn't plug itself in. It doesn't program itself yet. It's on the way. You know, we have to make them work. We have to learn how to utilize them to make them sound the way we want them to sound. So, uh, this is why, this is why you know, Quincy you know, and, and, and I can get together. And no matter, and what, no matter what kind of instrumental, instrumental sounds, sounds we have, we, we, we use them we according, to according to what we feel. Oh, thank you.